everyone. Greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV radio and podcast with Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace. Uh, hello to you guys. We are brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company. They got a flavor for every freedom loving American. They put the roast on date right there in every bag because freshness is kind of their jam. They want to make sure that they get it to you fresh, unlike those big box stores who can give it to you burnt. All right. So if you want to try it today or try it again, get a nice discount when you go to firstcup.com and use the promo code DACE. Again, firstcup.com. Use the promo code DACE at firstcup.com with the promo code DACE. All right, coming up on today's show. Next hour, it'll be your turn to ask me anything. Todd has the questions. He's handed them to Aaron. I will see and respond to them in real time next hour. Uh, at the bottom of this hour, Bob Vanderplatz will be joining us. But let's get it started, as we always do, with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by O and two. Donald Trump left us the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War. Somehow, someway, a 58-year-old with a backpack and a long gun was able to make his way onto the golf course at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago and just happened to be sitting in bushes as Trump played a spur-of-the-moment unscheduled round of golf. Look, are they a threat to democracy? Yes. Are they going to take our rights away? Yes. Are they going to put people's lives in danger? Yes. Secret Service scouting a hole in advance of where Trump was playing spotted Ryan Routh hiding in those bushes, opened fire, and later detained him. America! As we begin this election year, we must be clear, democracy is on the ballot. Your freedom is on the ballot. We all know who Donald Trump is. Again, somehow, some way, we learned more about this Ryan Routh in the two hours after his assassination attempt than we still know about Thomas Crooks two months after his. We have to defeat a person who is a threat to our democracy of a kind that we have not seen. At the beginning of our, of our Country. Ralph's social media history was quickly scoured by online sleuths, and it was discovered he was a Kamala Harris supporter who espoused the Donald Trump is a threat to democracy talking points you've heard ad nauseum from Democrats and is a prolific Democratic donor. And um, it is just uh, uh, unquestionable at this point that that man cannot see public office again. He is not only unfit, he is destructive to our democracy, uh, and he has to be. Uh, he has to be eliminated. Routh is also a major fan of Ukraine, who was profiled by the New York Times and Newsweek Romania in 2023 as a recruiter for the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. America, make no mistake, Donald Trump is a plague on the American conscience. He was even seen in a propaganda video for Ukraine's neo-Nazi-controlled Azov Battalion. Everything he does is despicable. The reason why it doesn't end his career is because his supporters are just as despicable. Routh also wrote a book in which he urged Iran to assassinate Donald Trump. I talk about the fact that when we swore in finally in January, that we swore to defend against those that are coming against us, whether they are domestic or international. And right now, I feel like MAGA in general, they are threats to us domestically. Anyway, here's how NBC News and Lester Holt led their Sunday evening newscast following a brief report on the latest attempted assassination. Today's apparent assassination attempt comes amid increasingly fierce rhetoric on the campaign trail itself. Mr. Trump, his running mate J.D. Vance, continue to make baseless claims about Haitian immigrants in Ohio. Here's the lead story last night for 60 Minutes on CBS following the attempted assassination assassination. Democracy stopped for about six hours. The vote was counted at 344 a.m. Learning English today, today's phrase is they're trying to kill him. They're trying to kill him. This morning, former FBI assistant director Chris Swecker told Fox Business. I want to know how that person knew to be there at that golf hole at that time that day. He's either surveilling uh, Donald Trump or he was in, uh, he received some inside information. That's pretty sinister if that's the case, because that implicates a third party, either wittingly or unwittingly. Ryan Routh fled Mar-a-Lago after his attempted assassination, but was apprehended in bordering Martin County, Florida. Martin County Sheriff Will Snyder also told Fox News he's got more questions than answers. Where is the suspect now? I know he's behind bars, but where? Well, what we did is we turned him over to the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Palm Beach County sheriff's office so i don't know where he is right now okay um did he did he say 
any, how did he know that Donald Trump was going to be playing golf? How was he, how did he have access to his schedule? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question. Uh, you know, we are the border county to Palm Beach. You can't get out of their county without coming through ours. But we don't have the intel from, from the scene there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's hard for me to imagine how he got within rifle range of, of President Trump. This morning, Joe Biden, who is still president, in case you forgot, says, Thank God the president's okay. I think we got a full report so far. We're down there tonight. But one thing I want to make clear, the service needs more help. And I think the Congress should respond to their needs if they, in fact, need more services. And finally, I want to leave you with this. Late last week, veteran Democrat Senator Richard Blumenthal spoke to media. Blumenthal is part of a bipartisan panel of top congressional leadership inquiring into the failures around the Secret Service leading up to the July 13th attempted assassination of Donald Trump. That panel was briefed in a closed-door meeting by acting Secret Service Director Ronald Rowe, and there's an interim report coming out, supposedly, about that failed assassination attempt. Here's what Blumenthal had to say. I think the American people are going to be shocked astonished and appalled by what we will report to them about the failures by the Secret Service in this assassination attempt on the former president. But I think they also ought to be appalled and astonished by the failure of the Department of Homeland Security to be more forthcoming, to be as candid and frank as it should be to them in terms of providing information. So top Democrat Richard Blumenthal says the Department of Homeland Security is not being forthcoming about their investigation into the original attempted assassination of Donald Trump back on July 13th. And somehow we knew more in two hours about this Ryan Routh than we have in two months about Thomas Matthew Crooks. I'm sure that's nothing. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron, that is an incredible montage. Yep. I mean, the, the, the editing that you did there to put that together, to give our audience a complete portrait of what is happening in the country, brother, that was, a, before we do anything else, I just want to say that was absolutely masterful. So good job out of you. Just doing my civic duty. And you did it well. Aaron's montage brought to you by our friends over at My Patriot Supply. If you watch that and think it's going down. Uh, I don't know what other reaction you could have. So make sure you get the four-week emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Uh, they'll send it over to you as fast as humanly possible. It also ships to you not just as fast as humanly possible, but free as well. You can save 50 bucks on your four-week emergency food kit. That's breakfast, lunch, dinner. Even drinks and snacks are included. It's the full complement of 2,000-plus calories you need per day. Lasts for up to 25 years as well. So again, $50 off the four-week emergency food kit uh, that you want to have in your home right now, shipped fast and free when you go to preparewithdace.com. Again, head over to preparewithdace.com. Um, there's a reason why I have amended the old saying that history doesn't repeat it rhymes. Um, I've amended it over the years on this show to history doesn't just repeat, it also rhymes. And it's it's because the same forces are at play throughout all of human history. So you, you see arcs play out. You see patterns play out. Uh, you see scripts play out. Because this place that we call home here, this mortal coil, this planet, is a celestial battleground. It's the ultimate north versus south, heaven and hell. And the languages change, and the customs change, and the eras change, and the technology evolves. But, but the core battle for dominion on this planet rages on and remains. And this is, if there was ever a moment for our country where a biblical worldview is something we dramatically need right now to, to truly understand the signs of the times and therefore what to do about them, this would be it. 
We've had other darker times in our nation's history than this right now, but we were a more biblically literate people during those times than we are now. Why is that important? Because the word of God is basically the owner's manual to the planet. Imagine a warning light comes on in your vehicle, but you don't have the owner's manual. Might not even be something that serious, but since you don't know the owner's manual, you don't have the owner's manual, you don't know how to fix it. And you can break a lot of things trying to fix it. For example, if, if, if you see injustice in the world, but believe in your heart there is no God, you will have, therefore, government step into the role of God to do all kinds of things to balance these scales of justice that will then end up, because you are missing the most basic fact of the universe, because you are in denial of or rejection to the owner's manual to this planet, you will therefore then end up making things all the worse, trying to fix a problem. Because you don't have that owner's manual, you cannot properly diagnose. You, you don't understand what that warning sign on your dashboard is. And with that last statement, I basically just summed up pretty much the last 50, 60 years of American history. The Bible is not an old, dusty tome. It's not an old book. It doesn't tell us what once happened. It is an eternal book that tells us what always happens and what is happening right now. And if you understand that, then you you see the patterns. You're like Neo. The, the numbers are scrolling down the screen, but you see what is actually within those numbers. You understand the code. You have learned to code in the most meaningful sense. So let me give you a pattern. JFK is originally shot, we're told anyway, by someone with, quote, Maggie's drawers, um, a questionable background. We, we still don't know the entire history of Lee Harvey Oswald. Still, 60 years later, we still don't know everything. We still don't know. Still don't know his true motivations. One government panel told us he acted alone. Uh, another governor in, in the 1964, another governor, government panel in 1979 said that he killed JFK but did not act alone and had some elements of connections to the mob and, uh, and, and to those who were uh, strident anti-communists. We, we don't know. We don't know to this day. We don't. It's been 60 years. Similar to what Aaron pointed out with the math club shooter, we, we don't really know. It's been two months. Which on which in today's information superhighway is like 10 years. At the rate information moves and processes today, two months is about a decade. We still have the largest mass shooting in American history in Las Vegas. That's the only mass shooting for whatever reason the spirit of the age has chosen not to try to politicize. Weird. And we still know basically nothing. How a guy on the most surveilled strip in this hemisphere built a sniper's nest right there. And no one said a word. And no one still knows. That was several years ago, which is like 60 years in today's technology. We don't know anything. RFK is shot by a man named Sirhan Sirhan. Who years later admitted that he did so as a Palestinian, as a Jordanian Palestinian. If you guys know the history of the PLO and the country that uh, the Palestinian state, there is, when we say things like there's no such thing as Palestine, there is no such thing as the Palestinian people. Most of these are people that were thrown out of Jordan. That's, we're going back to that history. It's not a pejorative, it's a fact. Not a put down any more than bio biology is bigotry. It's history is not a put down, it's a fact. And he admitted, yeah, I, I shot RFK Jr. because of his strong support for Israel. He admitted it 20 years later. And so the first shooter, bad shot, hits a one in a million, apparently. And 60 years goes by, and we still ha cannot fully construct the biography of Lee Harvey Oswald. The 
the other shooter just is really ticked off about a candidate's position on a foreign policy issue he vehemently disagrees with. That's exactly what we just saw play out here this summer. Guys, same exact pattern. History doesn't just repeat, it rhymes. Because the same people are writing, the same forces are writing the lyrics. We have a guy who's a bad shot, gets a head shot. Thankfully, he doesn't miss. Because Trump's head goes back into the right, completely incidentally, to dodge the bullet, unlike JFK's, who went back into the left after he couldn't. And then here's a guy just weaponized, finally, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine caused celeb. Let me shoot the president. The questions here. So this kid from the math club went full Peter Parker mode. And demonstrated Mr. Miyagi levels of parkour to outscale the entire Secret Service. Get a shot within 175 yards of Donald Trump, a clean headshot, even though the dorsal view uh, we all have seen. He's just um, rummaging around, very visible. How he wasn't taken out, we don't know. But yet he was eventually taken out after he fired, of course, from over 400 yards away. So they had some form of extended perimeter, and yet they didn't take him out before he shot. Okay. This guy apparently happens to know Trump's private golf schedule, even what hole he's going to be on. This guy's criminal history, by the way, goes back to 2002. So how was he even able to acquire this kind of a weapon? He's been arrested, charged with multiple things over the years. And he just so happens to know where Trump is, which hole he's on. <laughs> As Aaron said in his montage, they're just trying to kill him, guys. They're just trying to kill him. And this is after we've spent the last couple of years of they're just trying to put him in prison, guys. They're just trying to put him in prison. And this is after we spent a couple of years of they're just trying to impeach him, guys. They're just trying to impeach him. They tried to impeach him over something that ended up being proven as a total hoax. Such a blatant hoax. Even Bill Barr had to call BS on that. The second thing they impeached him for was for digging around for information between Hunter and, and Joe and what was in the grift of Ukraine. And that actually turned out to be true. They then finally, after numerous different trials or attempts therein, finally convicted him of a, apparently a campaign finance violation so grie gr grievous it required up to 130 years of prison, potentially. Oh, and they just so happened, the one they were able to get the, the conviction of was a state crime, so he can't pardon himself, even if he were to be president again. And now they've tried to kill him twice. Why? I, I think we need to answer this question. And for this answer, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I've not been shy, nor do I regret my level of frustration at times with the, the, the grifting that has been a part of Trump's political ascension that has taken what has always been a problem on the right and uh, turned it into um, a force of nature. But I think this is a time that if you've ever been a Trump skeptic as I have been early in his ascension, uh, as some of you are now, I think this is actually a time that, that if you if you have ever been or are currently in that camp, you need to have some self-awareness here. We need to have some self-awareness here. And we need to ask ourselves why. Yesterday was was a, was was a portrait of what life is like on the Trump train. I get up this morning or yesterday morning I'm about to go to church. I see Trump has decided to start a war with Taylor Swift for reasons. 
And I'm just like, I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to react. That's dumb. I'm just going to go to church and try to forget this. I get home from church and I'm just, I'm spent. Like I'm worn out. Like I can't do another election cycle like this, man. I just, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm to quote the great prophet, Alan Iverson. I'm tired. Get home from church, watching a little football with my son before he goes out with his girlfriend. Aaron sends me the text. I'm like, no way. And so just when you're exhausted and about to tap out, the spirit of the age raises its hand and says, yeah, we, that, we got to get shorty. That, Trump is basically John Travolta and get shorty. And they're going to keep gunning for him until they kill him or they get him. They're going to keep coming. Why? And, and there are some of us that look at his lack of discipline, look at his clumsiness, look at the fact he just seems to seek out gray areas and, and loves to do Icarus impersonations. And you think to yourself, what is it about this guy? Because you don't see it. And there have been times in my career that I have not. But I, this year, and it's taken me 10 years, but this year, particularly since July 13th, I, I think I fully get it for the first time. Donald Trump is Brexit incarnate. Donald Trump is Brexit manifested. It's not so much that they are concerned about whether Donald Trump can competently and consistently execute an agenda if given power that would undo that would that would undo what they've already embedded it's that they it's that it's that they fear Donald Trump represents a movement that that he is a herald in some respects Donald Trump there's been a lot of talk about which biblical figure does is Trump the most reminiscent of and I've compared him to Samson. I think that's the best one. But I think I might now have a better one. John the Baptist. Puts you on edge. Put your teeth on edge. Kind of out here. Attracting the people the system has forgotten about and run over. Or looking for something new. But a herald, a forerunner of whatever that new thing will be. He's not... He's not necessarily what everything has been pointing towards. But he, he represents a sign that it's coming. And that's what they're afraid of. My man Ron DeSantis never gets elected governor without Donald Trump. Never happens. Yes, the pro-life movement has fumbled the overturning of Roe v. Roe v. Wade at first and goal from the one. And now it's like third and goal from the 47. That's all true. But we didn't know that in June of 22. And all we saw is Donald Trump. Not evangelical born again George W. Bush. Not Ronald Reagan, I wrote abortion in the conscience of a nation. But Donald Trump is the one that took their ultimate shibboleth of the dam and smashed it in their face. It's it's when they look at Trump and they see what DeSantis and J.D. Vance, look at how J.D. Vance ruthlessly, efficiently, with precision, executes Trump's talking points. And, and it devastates them. It, dev it humiliates them in these clips. It just humiliates them. Ron DeSantis has almost erased the Democratic Party in, in the largest swing state in the country. That's what they're afraid of. That, that Trump is a beachhead. And what will come after him will people will be people who know how to actually do the stuff he just talks about. And maybe even fully himself does not understand. That he is the vanguard of something, of something new. That will truly challenge the hegemony of the West that they are, they are installing and the West that they are destroying. That's the fear. I think I finally have figured this out. Fully. And so he's got to go. Because that's the only organized resistance to all of this that actually exists in the West. 
as frustrating as it, as it is at times, as clumsy as it is at times, as WTF as it is at, the, at times, that's all there is. And the fear is if the fear of the spirit of the age is if this gets established, if this beachhead gets established, what will come next will be the true threat. Will be the true threat. He's the herald. He's the forerunner. And now I now I fully understand why after they shot him the first time, I went and grabbed the sign and put it in my yard. Why I had this like emotional reaction to it. I get it now. This is why. Because the people you look at in the future or you look at down the line and think, man, I just wish we could get to those guys. They know what they're doing. We're never getting to them if they take him out. And that's why they're trying to do it. He's the herald. He's the forerunner. So, Herod is going to serve his head up on a silver platter. I'll stop there. Todd and Aaron, what are your thoughts? Well, I I think, you know, Jesse Kelly has largely been right about this. Communists are killers. And these are not only the next iteration of communists, but these are the communists that largely did it with a march through the institutions that Steve has spent his career uh, telling you about the theory of what's going to happen if we're not careful, way more than many conservatives uh, were prepared to tell you that. Uh, but this latest iteration, so close to success, with a level of buy it, it is... It is providential that this happened during the football games yesterday and the football games didn't even break away. People are ready to hug communism now. This isn't, uh, and there's this one guy, all their violence now, which used to have to be much, much broader, much. And there's, and there's uh, various points in human history where this is evident. It's just one guy now. It's just one guy now. Everybody, yeah, the violence in the streets, it's all there, but nobody fights back against that. Everybody has acquiesced to that. It is here where there just seems to be some fight left in Donald Trump. But this is communism as it's always been. It's murderous by definition. You get in its way, it will kill you. And there's nothing new under the sun in that regard. Not even in American political history either. Uh, our colleague Oran McIntyre posted last night, you know, the regime memory hold the left wing, the regular left wing uh, terrorism of the 1970s in the United States, be that from the weather underground or other organizations as well. They're just trying to mainstream that again, just put a new skin on that cat, no pun intended, uh, put a new skin on that thing for the 21st century. This is not new in American left wing uh, politics. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. They're just trying to mainstream this again. They are trying to terrorize you by terrorizing him. That's what they're trying to do. I said this during the Democrat National Convention. I'm going to say it again. Everything that they represent, they are butchers. They are butchers of the good, the mm -hmm. true, and the beautiful. And that mm -hmm. was borne out again yesterday. The irony is that this guy seems to fit, and maybe he is, uh, but he seems to fit the profile of a CIA asset. I think he is, at least from what we know, which we don't know much about Thomas Matthew Crooks still after two months, he, he fits more of the, the profile of a CIA asset, but I think it's probably more likely in this instance that he was just the natural conclusion of the rhetoric that we've been seeing over and over and over again. We'll, we'll know more. We'll learn more, I'm sure. Well, I'm not sure about that. I hope we learn more uh, in the future. Uh, but it's just the natural conclusion of their ideology. It always ends with death. It always ends with bloodshed. It always ends with the butchering of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Because what it comes from is the chief butcher of all that is good, true, and beautiful. You know, I have criticized the pro-life industry for not being ready to fight our opponents where they are fighting us at the state level. And I think you have to fight your opponents where they're attacking you. We have to fight now where they're attacking us, and it's through Trump.
back here on the Steve Day Show, brought to you by our friends over at Patriot Mobile. If you are looking to divest from people who hate you, unfortunately, you just cannot completely do that yet in the economy we have. But one place, fortunately, where you can is with your mobile phone, the one thing that we all need uh, to thrive in modern society today. So make the switch today to Patriot Mobile. If you do, you'll get the same coverage the big communist boys give you. But uh, instead, you'll be getting it. You'll be getting it from people who don't hate you. You'll be giving money to people who then take that money, reinvest it back into the values that uh, you share with them. I've seen it with my own eyes. And you can also get a free month of service if you use my name, Steve, as your promo code when you go to patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Get a free month of service today. Patriotmobile.com slash Steve is where you can go. You can keep your number, switch your number, keep your phone, upgrade your phone. They'll customize it for you and your family's needs. Patriotmobile.com slash Steve. That's the mobile phone service that we use. Patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Use the offer code Steve for a free month of service today. Let's bring in our good friend, Bob Vanderplatz from The Family Leader. It is good to see you, Bob. And before we get to the uh, the main things I was going to talk to you about, I, I just want to finish a point and get your reaction to it as I was discussing another assassination, assassination attempt on uh, former President Trump yesterday. And I have, um, I, I think I've been justifiably critical for how the pro-life industry slash movement has completely fumbled the post-fall, uh, the post-Roe world since the fall of Roe and either either just cannot be equipped to fight this at the state level or just simply doesn't want to uh, because it decentralizes the process from D.C. where they control all the purse strings. And it probably it is a case by case basis, depending on which of these groups and organizations we're talking about. All right. But, but whatever the rationale is, it is very clear that they are not equipped and we're not equipped to fight where they're going to be attacked. You have to you have to you have to fight your enemies where they attack you. You cannot be the French behind the Maginot line just sitting there and you know Hitler just goes around you and he's you know taking out Scandinavia and all the countries behind you. You you have to fight where you're being attacked and the pro-life industry movement clearly has not been ready for that. Likewise and I, I am still seeing this in my feed, and I said I wasn't going to respond to it anymore, but I'm going to make one exception right here after another assassination attempt. If you are in my feed posting stuff to me like, this show's lost the plot since they started shooting Trump. Guys, that is the plot, okay? When they're trying to kill the people they think represent you, that's the plot, guys, Okay. It's very obvious what the plot is. If you think you're doing some form of reverse jujitsu, ninth dimensional geometric math, because you cannot get beyond your hatred for Trump, you cannot get, you cannot move beyond the mistakes that he had made when he was president before. You're the one that's missing this here, okay? The the one they're trying to kill. That's the that's the one they think is the threat, guys. That that's the one. And you don't have to like him every day. You don't have to endorse everything he says and does. But just you cannot be like the don't be like the pro-life movement in industry. We're, it's very clear we, where we're being attacked. They're trying to kill that guy. OK, they're trying to kill that guy. Somehow, somehow a convicted felon with a 20 year rap sheet acquires an AK-47 and just happens to know what hole the president is going to golf on on a day that isn't even on his private schedule. OK. Somehow the math club kid who couldn't do one chin up in school goes full Peter Parker in full view of the Secret Service and gets a headshot. Come on, man. You're the ones that have lost the plot. You are you are what you accuse the Trump cult of being. You're the cult. You're the ones who are missing this. It's right in front of your face. Right in front of your face. You are you are making the same mistake the pro-life movement makes. You need to be willing to fight where you're being where your enemy is attacking you. And through him is where we are being attacked. And I just wanted to state that before we move on, Bob. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's without question. As a matter of fact, my father in law used to put it very simply. He would say, There's no reason to shoot a sleeping dog. You take a shot at somebody that is a threat to you or that's on attack. The reason they're going after President Trump without question, he disrupts their complete narrative, their worldview. He's not perfect. Obviously, he's not a perfect guy. But boy, they see him as somebody that's a complete threat. And they're, they're going to do everything they can to make sure he does not get back in that White House, including taking him out. And you're right. What happened in Pennsylvania, you know, it just happened at Mar-a-Lago as well. Um, 
I, I think, Steve, you're, you're spot on here. Regarding the pro-life movement, uh, they weren't ready to win. They were not ready to win. They need to get on a message and then get on attack as well. And why life matters and a culture of life wins uh, versus running away from this, uh, running away from this. So I think you're exactly right. By the way, breaking from ABC News, they're saying that Ryan Wesley Routh, the attempted assassin, spent 12 hours surrounding Trump's golf course without being confronted. 12 hours. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered once again. It seems like every time we do one of these, it's like there's a lot of questions to be answered. When you see somebody go up on a uh, Morton building, a, a tin roof, who's got a clear shot at the president, but he's going, ah, oh, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. How in the world do you do you go around Mar-a-Lago that many times without at least being detained for questioning about what are you doing? Then there are subtle attempts to take him out. And, and, and we saw one of these, I think, yesterday. It was trending all over uh, political media and on X yesterday. And the, uh, the, the Register's Iowa poll, uh, which is the Bloomberg pollster, Ann Seltzer, has a renowned reputation, somebody you and I have known for many years, okay? But, but this poll she put out yesterday of Trump only being up, in, up, up for in Iowa is complete and total junk. And I'll prove it to you. In her own crosstabs... She has Trump winning independence by five points. Our independents are the largest voter block in the state of Iowa, by the way. They're about 42% of Iowa voters are independents. Okay. So she has Trump winning that block by five points. She has Kamala minus 11 favorable. She has Kamala only with a 42% approval rating in her job as vice president. Okay. So she's underwater herself. On, on both a professional and personal metric. Trump is going to win independence by five points. And somehow she produces out of those findings, those are her findings, I'm quoting her own poll. Out of that poll, she comes up with a top line result that in an era when we have more registered Republicans than we've ever had in Iowa history right now, over 700,000 of them, Trump is only going to win the state by four points. That is simply not possible. He could he could win the state by only four. OK, and all those things that she says about Kamala Harris could be true, but they cannot be true at the same time. That universe, that math does not exist. That's a total bunk poll. And yet. You know, just gets reported and regurgitated as if it's news. And Steve, that's a, my first thought on that. That's a narrative poll, creating a narrative like, you know what, if if she's going to be within striking distance of Trump in the state of Iowa, a state that has gone remarkably red over the past decade, more Republicans re registered than ever, and Trump's winning independence by five. But if she can make the narrative that Kamala Harris is within the margin of error right now, beating Trump in the state of Iowa, then you know what? Not only is Kamala Harris probably going to win in a landslide across the country, but you're going to lose the Senate, you're going to lose the House, you're going to lose all these down-ballot races and state legislatures. This was a narrative poll. And Steve, when I read that poll initially, right away I thought back to, to 2010. You know what poll I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It was my own gubernatorial race. I was saying I was going to get beat by 29 points. Why? That was a narrative poll. And the reason they didn't want me being governor is because I said on day one I'd issue an executive order that restores marriage between one man and one woman until the legislature votes differently or until the people of Iowa vote differently. But a court doesn't get to make this decision. They wanted to make sure I had no place close to that thing. They're doing the same thing now. So they may not be the shooter outside of Mar-a-Lago. They might not be the kid climbing up a Morton building. But here they are. They're putting out a narrative poll, and that's all it is, because none of the crosstabs add up to her only losing Iowa by four points or potentially winning Iowa. To me, that is ridiculous. It needs to be called out for what it is. And this is why the average American says, I don't have trust in the media. I don't have trust in these polls. I don't have trust in the elite. And that's why Trump is more and more of a threat to them, because he challenges their narrative. That brings us to, to point number two, I think we should discuss. And that is whether or not Trump should agree to another debate. Um, Kamala it came right out after the first debate last week said she wanted another one, which I don't really believe. I think they know that Trump doesn't want another one. And so they just said that. Um, but there's a lot of debate right now on the right people whose opinions I respect, by the way, who have strong takes on this on both sides. Uh, one group says, hey, 
Um, Don't walk into any more ambushes. Take your case directly to the American people. I see the logic in that. Another group says that this is still the most the the largest audience of potential voters that we can get access to. And we're going to be badly outspent here down the stretch over the year on this campaign. And we can't turn it down. I certainly understand that. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, man, if I was advising the former president, I I don't know what I'd recommend. I I can I can see this both ways. But uh, where, where do you come down on this? Well, I'm with you. I see the logic of both of both uh, cases to be made, but I definitely come down the side of he needs to do another debate. Uh, whether it was ABC News and being three on one, we get that. But you know what? That should not be a shocker or a surprise to anybody that it was three on one when you're going into ABC News. The thing is, is he needs to control that debate. He needs to control the moderators. He needs to fact check the moderators as well as Kamala Harris. He needs to show that he's president. I believe she got an incredible bump out of that debate. Now, is it going to be the thing that's going to determine the election or not? I don't know. But it definitely forces a lot of images in people's minds who are going to make the determining factor on Election Day, whether Trump gets to be president or Kamala gets to be president. And Steve, what I saw in that debate, Kamala didn't scare me about just being Kamala one term. Kamala scared me about being Kamala Two terms. So when people say, I don't know if we can survive another another term of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I'm thinking, can we survive another two terms of them? Because that's so to me, I think what Trump needs to do is accept that debate, play the alpha male here. And whether it's NBC News or whoever they agree to be the debate, the debate moderators, but make sure that you hold them in check, hold her in check. You're the alpha male. You're the president. Take your case to the American people with her on the stage with you. And this time, I would look at her. I would look at, I think a mistake that was made is they just looked at the moderators, but he never looked at her. She looked at him consistently. I think he needs to stare her down and basically expose her for the fraud that she is. She's not about the average American. She's not about lifting up Todd and Aaron and you and me. She has a worldview that is extreme and out of touch with America and and what our republic is all about. I think he needs to take that debate and take it to them and then go on and do a barnstorming of America about how you took it to Kamala in that debate. But I believe after that first debate, I believe he needs to do another debate. But I also agree with you, Steve. I think the reason Kamala came right out and said, listen, I want another debate. That was fun. They knew ahead of time that Trump didn't want to do another debate. Trump would give her one time and that's it. So it's kind of like I'd call her bluff right now. I would call her bluff. Trump is a skilled debater. He knows the facts. He knows what the American people want to hear. Take it to her and take it to the moderators. Finally, we had uh, two of the uh, most high profile popular athletes in America today come out last week. Pat Mahomes, quarterback for the uh, two time uh, reigning Super Bowl champion Chiefs. And then I was very own Caitlin Clark come out last week and say, hey, you know, our job is not to be endorsing candidates and getting involved in partisan politics, uh, but to you know make people aware they can register to vote, have their voice be heard, et cetera. Kind of a position we heard a lot in the 80s and 90s uh, before everything had to be a, uh, a culture war. But um, they're kind of be, they're also being criticized by people on both sides. People on the left are like, "Hey, get with the program here and promote you know our agenda," and people on the right are saying, "Listen, man, you know we're in a war right now and don't have time for neutrality." So, what do you think? Well, first of all, I think uh, Caitlin Clark is exceptionally refreshing in a Taylor Swift world, uh, a Steph Curry world, and if she wants to weigh in on who she wants to vote for or whatever at some point. Um, I think that's up to her. But I think what she's doing is she's stiff arming and she's not taking the bait of you need to jump on the Kamala Harris train right now. What she's saying is, you know what, I'm going to play the game of basketball. What I like about Caitlin Clark, Steve, what I want to talk to you a little bit about Caitlin is that not just because she scored 35 points last night, not just because she broke the rookie record, not only because she's changed the game of women's basketball, but as I told our team today, if you walked by her on the street and you did not know she was Caitlin Clark. You did not know she was the MVP of collegiate basketball and she's she's changed the game of, of professional basketball. You would never look at her and go, I bet she's just an outstanding basketball player. She is somebody that obviously God has gifted with talent, but she has used that talent with a drive to be the best, to become the best. 
She's worked awfully hard on everything that she has done to become the best. Two is, she makes those around her a heck of a lot better. I watch those highlight reels, and I see what she does with her teammates. Her teammates are finally getting in a position where they can make shots or have easy layups. Because of Caitlin Clark, she makes her teammates better. But the other thing I like about her, Steve, she's not playing victim, uh, victim mentality. It's not, I mean... Yeah, she gets beat up. She should have been on the Olympic team. She shouldn't have been pushed down by Angela Reese, but she never takes the bait. She rises the standard above. This is a game of basketball. It's a tough basketball game. I look for the day when I can earn my right to, to represent the United States in the Olympic Games. She always takes the higher road. But then lastly, and we just read Psalm 71 in, in devotions about uh, basically – when I'm old, let me still speak to the next generation. Let me draw that next generation to you. When you listen to Caitlin Clark, she's always about those little girls watching her in the stands. I want those little girls to understand they can do what I do, that they can break my record. I think she is exceptionally refreshing for somebody who cannot believe the demands that have got to be on her, who have changed the game of basketball, who's Taylor Swift without being Taylor Swift. And probably, Steve, the reason I wanted to talk about Caitlin Day, I had my grandkids, uh, Darla and I, uh, we have two grandchildren, uh, Caroline and Dixon James. And we brought them into our Hy-Vee grocery store. And we're in the Hy-Vee grocery store, which is now like a mini mall. Uh, but I saw a Caitlin Clark jersey, and I showed my four-year-old Car Caroline. I said, hey, you recognize this jersey? And right away, this four-year-old said, that's Caitlin Clark. She's having a dynamic impact, and I think uh, we need more like her, not less like her. Should she weigh in or not weigh in this presidential election? I think she's doing what she needs to do right now, and that's be the best at what she can be without taking the bait of all this woke agenda. Good stuff, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, when we come back here after the top of the hour break, it is going to be your turn to ask me anything, and I would imagine – given what uh, is going on in the country some of these questions are going to pack a wallop so we're looking forward to that this may be one time maybe the only time i'll ever mention this that todd will not roll his eyes or condemn me but it's a hundred days till christmas as of right now and it kind of feels like we could use a little bit of christmas right now todd i think i might even get an amen out of you for that yeah, yes i'll take it yeah all right, we'll come back. Hour two is next. Stay tuned. All right, we are back here with Hour Two, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast alongside Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. I am Steve Dace. And you can let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. You can email us, Steve at SteveDace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. -E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on X, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. And don't forget, if you listen to the podcast version, you're a big part of our show. So thank you. Please uh, show how much you love us by hitting us with the five-star review. And also hit subscribe, or if you're on iTunes, follow. And that'll make sure that every time we do one of these new episodes. It shows up right there in your podcast feed every single time. Our friends at Preborn show up every single time. There is a fight between her mom and her baby and her conscience, and they win a majority of these, and they want to keep winning them, but they need support from people like us, and they do this the old-fashioned way. Soul-to-soul -soul combat, they confront, they use truth and grace, they confront moms gently but it's a confrontation nonetheless. They confront moms with the knowledge via ultrasound that that second heartbeat is not yours. That belongs to another person, not an unviable tissue mass. And when they win that argument and the mom's conscience is convicted and she doesn't go through with murdering her child, now is when they offer her grace because – Often it's because she's in a desperate situation that she's considering this in the first place, right? So that, that, that assistance can be counseling. It can be prenatal care, postnatal care, uh, car seat help, uh, diaper help, formula help. All of this stuff, by the way, all of it, ultrasounds, all the assistance, all of it is free of charge, even though this stuff doesn't cost nothing. It's not free. And that's where we come in. 
If you want to make a tax-deductible donation today, go to preborn.com slash Steve. Again, that's preborn.com slash Steve. Together, we've helped preborn save tens of thousands of babies and their mamas here at The Blaze. Let's save tens of thousands more at preborn.com slash Steve. All right, with that, it is time to play some Ask Me Anything. Todd, you have the questions. I have yet to see them, and you have chosen them, I hope so, carefully and meticulously. Handed them over to Aaron, and Aaron, you may fire when ready. We will begin with Scott Lambert, who says, Although a Trump win is obviously a much-needed occurrence, it seems to me that at some point a regular citizen boycott or strike against the federal government is eventually going to be needed, too. Are there any areas legally, financially, or corporately that we could begin to think about organizing when that time comes around? So here's the problem that we have with that. And we we have, why can't we do like a Sons of Liberty is kind of what you're describing, right? Where... It starts off with pockets of communities within the colonies essentially opt out of red coat control. And if you're a British crown bureaucrat that goes into these neighborhoods and attempts to impose Mad King George's uh, Mad King George's will, you're lucky if you come out of there only tarred and feathered. And they're essentially ungovernable. And redcoats know, I don't want to go in there because they're going to shoot back, okay? Or a Boston Tea Party kind of an act. I, I want to make sure that we do not overly romanticize our founding fathers to the point that we exempt them from the perils of human nature that are present within us. We, we do this in Christianity with the early church, too, that we, we act as if they somehow tiptoed between the raindrops. No, guys, two people that were there and saw the miracle of the church walked right up to, to Peter and just lied to him right to, right to his face about their money. They weren't better people in the early church than us. And the founding fathers were not better people than us either in terms of... Um, being exempt from the, the human condition. Todd would point out, and he'd be correct in doing so, that they also did not have the level of comfort and distraction that we have today. And that is true. Except a lot of the founding fathers were awash in comfort. That's what made them so extraordinary, is they set that aside. But they did not do this overnight, guys. They, they did not do this overnight. In fact, I'm going to look this up right now because I know it was some time. When was the Boston Tea Party? All right. So the Boston Tea Party took place the week before Christmas, 1773. It would be another nearly three years, summer of 1776, before the convention in Philadelphia declared independence. On top of that, these battles went on... Um, for for many many years uh when was the boston massacre uh, let me look that up here when was the boston massacre march 5th 1770 it would be nearly six and a half years before independence would be declared i think that we've kind of romanticized this to the point that you know uh king george the third uh, stepped out of his lane once and the founding fathers were like dirty, hairy man feeling lucky punk. No, no, that's not what happened at all. They spent nearly a decade pleading, petitioning the British crown, sending in emissaries, ambassadors. And if you know the story, and if it, and it, it, you, you, ironically, maybe the greatest telling of this story was done by Disney. Uh, they did a movie many, many years ago called The Sons of Liberty. That's when Walt was running the company. They would not do this story today. Okay. Um, but what really was the final tipping point 
is when the Redcoats said to the Minutemen, hey, you need to tell us where your guns are so that we can secure them. Well, they understood what that meant. They, they understood that that was their insurance policy against just going from quartering Redcoats to just having them burn down their homes. That was the check and balance. That they had these secret munitions of weapons that in a minute they could call upon and in a minute men would show up to fight if the situation warranted it. There was a check and balance there. And now all of a sudden the red coach are like, yeah, we're going to take that away. They knew what that was a precursor to. They knew. And that now is the moment when they're out of agency. Take that last phrase I just said right there and underline it, circle it, put it in bold and italics. When they were, when they were out of agency is when they finally acted to the extent that led to the birth of this country. And they explain why right in the, right in the Declaration of Independence. I won't be able to quote it directly. It'll be a paraphrase. But humankind is predisposed to suffer indignities and tyrannies and oppressions as long as they're sufferable. We are sons of Adam. God walking in the garden saying to Adam, hey man, I, I put you in charge of this place. I give you the keys to the car called Earth. One day, the serpent shows up. Dude, what you doing? What happened here? I got nothing. I, I got nothing. And this woman you gave me, she was the real problem here. Let me tell you something, Pops. That's who we are. That's our species right there. We don't ever proactively act. We just don't. There's, 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 there's usually a few people who will get it and proactively act or one person who will proactively act or a small group of people who will. And then they end up getting known by another term. Martyrs. <laughs> All right. Visionaries usually become martyrs. And that the critical mass happens when agency is lost. So going back to what Todd harps on on the show a lot, comfort is another term for agency. I have comfort in believing that um, I can watch Fox News all day, do nothing more, never go to a school board, never go to a city council, don't, don't, don't know the name of a county supervisor where I live, vote for Trump and I'll save America. And then, and then I, I have agency in no longer being an active participant in the process. And um, because I did my job, citizenship just comes down to what I do for however long it takes between the getting in line and getting my turn to vote. That's the extent of it. Like parenting is however long it took to conceive the children. And there's, there's just no other commitment after that. Now, how does this answer your question? Cause you asked about a very specific process. This answer is not just your question, but any question about a specific process. We're not where we are because we haven't thought of the right process. We're where we are because we couldn't do it even if we did. The people are the problem. The people are the problem. And it is our history as a species to, to not do extraordinary things until we have to. Until we have to. To do the easy thing, to do the thing that the path of least resistance we're accustomed to, that is characteristic of our species. So whether it's what you came up with in your question, whether it is um, a consortium of red states, like what our good friend Daniel Horowitz wants to do, um, and, and I'm all for making red states red, red communities red, actually as red as the, as the blue ones are blue. None of those things can, ha the reason they haven't happened yet is not, no one thought of this. It's that no one wants to do it. The people are the problem. And I go back to a moment that comes up on this show quite often from last May 
At this meeting of Christian leaders I went to in Dallas, having a blunt conversation, spending the day with each other in prayer and having blunt off the record conversations with each other. Some of them would be names you would know probably if you're a believer and having blunt off the record conversations with one another about where the culture's at and where it's headed and all this talk of revival. And the elder statesman of the group gets up at the end and says, do you guys really know what you're asking God for? Because we're way too comfortable to be accepting a uh, revival. You're really asking God to turn up the heat. That's what you're really asking. So my fear is, is I look in my feet and I still see people acting as if they, they tried to kill him again on his own golf course. Not a big deal. We can afford an L here. We'll survive. My guy can win in four years. Like we're just doing conventional politics here. When they're just trying to assassinate our candidate and in, 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 out in the open multiple times. Just goes, I guarantee you those are really comfortable people. I guarantee you they are. And I will guarantee you that the extent of their activism in almost all cases, one or 2% of them will prove me wrong. But over 90% of those people, the extent of their activism is Twitter and voting. And they haven't done much else. There's not enough agency lost yet. There, there's just not. And it, that, and <laughs> Winston Churchill defended the realm against its own wishes. And in exchange, he was voted out of office. And now apparently it turns out he's, he's the villain of World War II. And Ron DeSantis tried to run for president. I called a globalist cuck for doing all the stuff that apparently we said we cared about and believed in. We don't like the people that are on the cutting edge. We don't. We don't like those people. That's why visionaries usually end up becoming martyrs. And it's usually only when we're up against the back door of the Alamo and it's, there's nowhere out, no way out between us and Santa Ana. That's usually when we get clever and necessity becomes the mother of invention. That's just human nature. I mean, I look at my own career. A lot of people said a lot of the same, are saying a lot of the same things about Mitt Romney. I said 15 years ago when it didn't pay to say those things, but it paid to put him on the cover of National Review and say he was the next Reagan. And doing stuff like that is how I've been largely excommunicated from the larger, more mainstream conservative movement. Oh, well, I'll live. But there usually has to be a lot more suffering before we start thinking about doing things like that. And it's not that suffering makes us smarter. It's that it makes us more desperate. Next question. We will continue on with Betsy Harmon Wooten, who says, I love your show. Recently lost my husband to an alcohol addiction. Question I have and would love to hear your answer to, as well as Todd and Aaron's is, would you characterize addiction as a thorn in the flesh? I wrestle with it. Probably, I would. Now, for those of you that are wondering what the, the and first of all, sister, my condolences. I'm just, I've, I've seen people in my own family drink themselves to death, intoxicate themselves to death, drug themselves to death, overdose themselves to death, as all of us have. So buried some people like that. So my condolences on behalf of our entire show and our audience for what you're enduring now as a widow. If you're, if you're wondering what the phrase thorn in the flesh comes from, um, it, it actually comes from the book of the Bible we're studying right now, Romans. And Paul, the author, writes about how he had a thorn in his flesh that he kept asking God to remove. And God refused and said, in your weakness, I am made strong. Now, we never know what the thorn in Paul's flesh is. And I think it's very wise not to disclose it. Because again, in our in, in the myopic condition we have as a species. 
if we found out what Paul's thorn in the flesh could be, and, and if you know anything about Paul's life, it could be a myriad of things. We know he was particularly angry at the Corinthian church. One of the letters he wrote to them was lost. He doesn't, you know, shy away from delivering a few uh, uh, rhetorical kill shots in several of his epistles. Could it have been anger? He's a single man traveling a very, um, you know, lascivious empire with lots of temptation, open sex cults everywhere you went within Rome. Could that have been the thorn in his flesh? Could it have been loneliness, unmarried? He could be shipwrecked. He could be abandoned. Um, he at times had, had friends turn on him and leave him. Could be. Could it be depression? Given all the things I just said, then house arrest, imprisonment, right? It, it, it could be a myriad of things. We don't know. And I think it's wise that the Holy Spirit never tells us what that thorn in the flesh is because we would have a tendency to say, okay, well, yeah, that doesn't relate to me. That's not my issue at all. But to hear a thorn in the flesh, we all have that. Now, The real challenge is, how do we respond to that? And do we seek the help in humility that we need to overcome that? Do we give ourselves over to it? But then there are also moments where, you know, you guys, we have a, a good friend of ours that we met in our audience that we met because he had a, a, a very good friend who was struggling with substance abuse and his Celebrate Recovery group stopped meeting because of lockdowns and ended up taking his own life, right? It's, it's human nature is complicated. We're not machines. We're not formulas. We're not algorithms. I am, I am using a guide for our Roman study based on the expository preaching of Charles Spurgeon. Considered by many the greatest Baptist preacher that ever lived, considered by many the greatest English-speaking preacher that ever lived. Well, if you know anything about Charles Spurgeon, though, he struggled with depression on and off throughout his life, including during his exalted tenure in ministry. He struggled with it. So... All of us have the thorn in the flesh. Is, is the addiction itself the thorn in the flesh? Is the addiction what we're using to self-medicate to avoid confronting that thorn in the flesh? And I, I think that is, a, uh, is on a person-by-person -person basis. You guys have any thoughts on this? Uh, I think that last part is really, really important, certainly as it applies to the way she asked the question. Uh, the, it, it, there's probably something else, perhaps multiple something else's, um, that speak to why, uh, drinking turned into alcohol addiction. So I, I, I think that frames everything that you said before it. Yeah, I think foundationally, yes, it is a, with it's not just alcohol. It's any attempt to fill the God shaped hole in our hearts. Um, foundationally, yes, that's a spiritual issue. I mean, there are there are offshoots of this conversation that we could talk about. But to answer that question as succinctly as possible, yes, foundationally, I think it is a thorn in the flesh. Ready to move on? All right. Yeah, ready to move on. Jason Faulkner says, what percentage of the electorate will vote for Cringella just to get the first female president? I think that'll be the majority of her vote. You know, so is it 60% of her vote, 70% of her vote? But all of their messaging is identity politics. It is fundamentally, I shouldn't say all, the majority of their messaging is fundamentally identity politics. So... You know, you, you, you get the response to what you market. 
people buy what you sold. So if that's the majority of their branding and messaging, I, I'm left to assume that'll be the majority of why people will vote for her. All right, next up, we go to Kent Miller. Was the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling with regards to campaign finance really so murky that the California Attorney General Kamala Harris could use it to force nonprofit groups to turn over their private donor lists? Furthermore, since A.G. Harris's open intimidation tactics against conservative donors was so effective and not only overturned by the Supreme Court until 2021, was it her willingness to apply ruthless lawfare tactics at that point and later in the support of the 2020 riots, ultimately the real reason that she's admired by the left and as a result is now currently sitting as the Democrat candidate for president? There is. This is a really smart take. Really smart take. Now, Ken, I, I doubt most Democrat voters know the things you just mentioned about her political career, but it's why she became a senator. You know, um, I don't. Heck, it's, Steve, you know, it's, it's why we had the takes we did early on about Kamala. Right. We just thought well, she thought was we, a gangster. I thought she was going to win that primary in 2020. Yes. That was my prediction. Yes. yes. Yeah. And she couldn't even get to Iowa because I saw how ruthless she had been. Yeah. As a senator and a, on a local level in California with David Delight and everything else. And I thought, OK, ruthless and and and, and a female Obama. How's this chick going to lose? Right? right. And then she went out there and did that first debate where she called Biden a racist and just wrecked him. Right. You know, and we're like, yeah, that's going to be her. OK. And then it never materialized. Now, I think we need to answer, though, why didn't it materialize? Because she had to get off script and she had to actually connect with people and voters in a retail way in Iowa. And, and there's not there's not a real person there, guys. This woman is a construct. There's not a real person there. She's been a she's been a is she Montel Williams side piece? Is she Willie Brown's uh, side piece? Is she the ruthless technocrat that went after David Delayden for daring to tell the truth? Um, is she the the ruthless attorney general who um, used the power of her office? As a will to power, is she the absolute nitwit we've seen as vice president? And you guys know what the answer to that question is? Yes. The woman is a construct. There's not a real person there. It's just a, there's a, there's a collection of, it, it's a bonfire of the vanities, guys. It's just a, it's a collection of craven instincts. Who do you need me to be? Dumb, stupid, slutty, ruthless. What do you need? I'm your Huckleberry. That's essentially her life verse. But to expose that, you have to get her off script, which is why I guess what they're not doing a lot of. Putting her off script. That's why I don't believe she really wants another debate. I think they're ecstatic that she served. She, you know, I don't think, I don't think Trump was necessarily terrible in that debate. I just think that the expectations for her were so low that she came across as baseline presidential, and that's a massive win for them. I mean, if I was on her debate team, I'm wiping the sweat off my brow. We survived, and that's a dub. All right, quick, go back to hiding. We'll use our institutional advantages from here. So there was another aspect of what I was going to say, and then you interjected there, Todd, but you made a good point. So, Aaron, put up the question one more time, if you could, please. Maybe it'll prompt the other part of this I wanted to, to point out. Can you do that or not? Um, all right. So, Citizens United, um, is that why the real reason she's admired by the left and as a result is now currently sitting as the Democrat candidate? For okay, yeah, that's it. Okay. So, this the dissident right, we've talked about them before, positively and negatively. And I, I find myself agreeing with, with the so-called dissident right about 100%, like 60% of the time. And then like the other 40%, I'm just out on. But the one area where I agree with their, in that 60% where I agree with them 100% of the time, is when they say things like, the right does not understand the patronage aspect of politics. They're correct. They're right about this. The reality is, Trump was condemned that all he would do is just put his own, uh, you know, schleppers in office if he won. Guys, his presidency would have been way better if he would have done that. Way better. 
I mean, way better. I mean, way better, guys. Instead, he hired Rince, Rex Tillerson, and on and on it goes. All the all those generals that don't want to support him now. He made a bunch of Elaine Chow, Ditch McConnell's wife. He made a bunch of terrible swamp hires, thinking that was art of the deal. No, art of the deal is you don't you don't get rid of Steve Bannon. You keep him, and you never hire Rex Tillerson for Secretary of State. Art of the deal is you make sure to reward the people who bled for you, who bleed for this. You reward them. The dissident right is right about that. So I fought him two weeks ago on Churchill. I'll, I'll fight with him on this. They're 100% right about this. Kamala did what they wanted her to do to David Daleiden in California. They gave her a Senate seat as a result. They made her vice president as a result of the things, Kent, that are in your note. We need to do a better job of that. Way better. Way better. And if I could say one thing to my friend Ron DeSantis, if he wants to run for president again, he specifically has got to get better on understanding the patronage aspect of politics. But the right as a whole must. Absolutely. Absolutely. You punish your enemies and reward your friends. And we too often will just turn on our own people and dissolve into tribalism. Are you in this faction? Why don't you got a tattoo? How many pieces of flair? Are you wearing the red hat? Are you not wearing the red hat? None of that matters. Who gets results? Reward them. Who doesn't? Don't. You never see the left say, well, let me bring in this like one pro-life guy. No, no, they don't even contemplate that. Well, let me just bring in this one like spirit-filled crit. No, they don't. They don't. No, not doing that. No. Nope. So on that, the dissident right and this program are 100% simpatico. They're completely correct about that. All right. I think we're probably, we probably don't have enough time. We do another not. question. Yeah. We're up against the break. Okay. All right. So... These have been really good so far. Hopefully the answers have been at least mediocre. We'll come back. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can on the back end of an Ask Me Anything here on The Blaze. Stay tuned. Listen, I, I know what you're thinking. It's It's crazy. That the same people who, right when the Sunbelt wave of COVID hit in 2021, decided we were uh, suddenly needing to ration the monoclonal antibody treatment everybody needed. The same people that uh, said, well, here's this drug we gave a Nobel Prize to in 2015, but now you need to know it's a horse dewormer and dangerous. The same people who were like, oh, this hydroxychloroquine we've given to tens of millions of people uh, and, 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 and saved countless lives with it is too dangerous to even consider. The same people who said, well, here's this cancer drug with a black box warning called remdethasnir. Let, let's, let's kill your kidneys with this and claim we're treating COVID. The same people who said, yeah, I, know, I know it's the year 2020 and 2021, but we have no way whatsoever to treat a pulmonary infection or inflammation at all other than just go home, wait till you can't breathe, then come back and we'll put you on a ventilator and we'll be you know, in the break room in between lung darts flipping a coin to see if you're alive or not in an hour. I know. I know. It's crazy that those exact same people and same forces would be like, let's just kill our political opposition. It's a great leap. I've lost the plot. I mean, I just, I'm in over my skis here. But just in case I'm not, check out our friends at Jace Medical. 
get the Jace case right now of the next batch of medications. They'll probably try to ban from you right when you need them the most. And you can expand it now into what you need and want customized for your needs and your family's needs. All right, get the Jace case right now when you go to jace.com slash Dace, J-A-S-E, J-A-S-E for jace.com slash Dace. Use the promo code Dace at checkout for a discount. Promo code Dace at checkout for a discount at jace.com, jace.com, promo code Dace. Also, let you know, coming up here in just a couple of weeks, if you live in the Dallas area, coming up in a couple of weeks, ladies, the Share the Arrows event from our colleague, Ali Stuckey, and she's hosting an event with Francesca Battistelli, Rosario Butterfield, Candace Cameron Bure, and more, uh, a chance to encourage and equip women. Uh, to live for Christ here uh, during an era when it is needed in America more than maybe ever before. So many different packages to fit your budget as well, from general admission to VIP to the premium all access. Get it all and all the information you need right now at sharethearrows.com. Go there today. This is coming up in Dallas on September the 28th, sponsored by Carly Jean of Los Angeles. Again, that's sharethearrows.com is where you want to go, sharethearrows.com. All right, with that, let's get back to some Ask Me Anything, gentlemen. All right, we'll continue with Cindy Pitkinney. A question for you and Todd. I'm seriously considering converting to Roman Catholicism, but the Pope's recent syncretic, uh, syncretic statements give me pause. I also realize that the media hates the Roman Catholic Church and will spin statements by the Pope. I haven't yet done my homework on his recent statements, but I'm wondering if y'all can shed some light on this issue. Assuming his statements have been reported accurately, isn't what he said heresy? So I'm going to give Todd the advantage of the last word on this because it's my show. So I typically get the last word any, on everything anyway. And I want to make this as fair as possible. So I'll go first. And then Todd, you can take however much time you want to respond to her. Um, I have, and, and Todd will back me up on this. I've always tried to be as fair as I can to uh, papal uh, statements of translation. And I've mentioned this before. There is a, uh, a wide cadre of, of media. Like I, we almost will never respond on this show to anything that corporate media says that the Pope said, unless it's like the 60 minutes interview where we can see him say it ourselves. Because, you know, the, uh, the corporate enemy media, there's a lot of projecting there. There's a lot of lapsed Catholics there. And so there's a lot of projecting of what we want a Pope to be, what we want the church in Rome to look like and say, to align with our beliefs and values. And and we especially, Todd, if I recall, saw this a lot the, the first few years of Pope Francis, where he would be accused of saying things that were not accurate, and the uh, papacy would have to come out and actually provide the actual translation of these things. Am I getting that right? There was a lot of this in the opening years, right? Yeah. Okay. And But what's happened is the Pope himself has spoken out more and more is he himself has more and more said some very problematic things. I took this quote seriously because it came from, I saw it from LifeSite News. And they're like a Catholic's Catholic, like Latin mass, or you're a heretic level Catholic Catholic. So I took it seriously because they were the ones raising the alarm bells about this. And for those of you that don't know, the Pope basically just said there's many paths to God. Every religion is an expression of God. Eh. So the... The Haitian religion that says, let me grab the geese and sacrifice them for uh, uh, Dormammu. That's a path to God? I don't think so. Uh, Islam says that Christ wasn't crucified, so therefore he couldn't even be resurrected from a death he never suffered. Meanwhile, Christianity says without the resurrection, we don't exist. So God is bipolar. Um, God sacrificed his son for nothing. Um, that's a, to me, that's a, that's an openly heterodoxical, just if not flat out heretical statement. I agree. And as we pointed out, since we've been discussing this pretty openly on the show, since uh, the 500th anniversary of the reformation in 2017, the position of our show is that the, the dominant disagreement between Catholics and Protestants is not, um, theological but that the theological differences stem from an ecclesiastical argument. What is the ultimate authority? What is it? Okay. And so I think I got a question. I, I think I did a ask me anything just on Twitter on my flight home from Dallas after the debate last week. And, and a guy just asked me and I answered it. What would it take for you to consider converting to Roman Catholicism? And I'll, uh, it, my answer to him, I think applies Cindy to your note. 
Okay. To me, there is no purpose in claiming that you have a level of authority on par with the scriptures, even to the point of being the source of interpreting them correctly for the people. If you're not actually going to exercise said authority, why would I entertain your, um, your um, beliefs of tertiary issues like veneration of Mary, for example, or a fundamental issue we have a disagreement on, all right, which is justification by work, something that's come up a lot for the last several, um, uh, you know, cycles of our Roman study, for example. Um, if you're not going to exercise your own authority, for, for example, I'll just look at my own life, okay? I mean, what, what, everything I've said about the scriptures was, if it was true, it was true regardless of whether I have a moral failing or not. And if it was false, it is false regardless of whether I have a moral failing or not. But would not a moral failing greatly impact the credibility by which I would speak to those issues? And the answer is yes. Which is why the character of the believer matters greatly. And when we get stuff wrong and we blow it and we all will, and when we fall and we all will, you got to own that. But if you're not going to exercise the authority and power you claim to have, why would I then say, well, that looks like, that looks like the authority. Because really to me, the core difference in disagreement here is ecclesiastical. So my answer to this guy was, I just start rounding up all the people that deserve execu excommunication and talk to me. I'll listen. But you cannot expect me to have more of a belief in your credibility and authority of an, as an institution than you have or than you exercise. So I'll stop there. And Todd, you can get the last word on this and then we'll move on. Yeah, now it's Todd, time for Todd to play his uh, greatest hits uh, or the worst hits because there's nothing new here with Pope Francis. Taken in a vacuum is what this says. Uh heretical of course but here's the we've been down this road before with the pope this is something he was riffing on in between a, a, a you know a paragraph talking about other things and he gets so sloppy and messy because instantly people come to his aid which you shouldn't have to do for the pope and show all the times when he gives various versions very strongly and unapologetically jesus is the way the truth and the life this is why my, as my answer to this is always um, please pray that Pope Francis's papacy soon comes to an end. He, he is so confusing of when we have, I mean, this is always a matter of souls. So we never have time to be this confusing. But right now, in, in the wake of the spiritual warfare that is undergoing worldwide, to be this unclear and he was forgetting i can't remember which foreign country he was visiting at the time uh you know his he always tries to convey like get give people what he thinks is hope i i was trying to find a way to convey maybe what he was thinking because he's there's a pattern of behavior here if if you if you will and it's along the lines of what steve talked about you know is there hope to be found when you are surrounded by paganism or other religions? I, here's an example. Ga gaze against groomers. Okay? None of us believe homosexuality is a, a moral lifestyle. We believe it is a sinful lifestyle. Would many of us agree that they have done important work in fighting against transgenderism i'll just speak for myself i think sure. they've done courageous work i mm -hmm. i think pope francis based on again a pattern of behavior and a pattern of saying things that fly in the face of what he said here i think he's trying to say something like that but it's very sloppy and i everybody who's pushing back on this has an absolute right to you're the pope for god's sakes can we we, we don't we need you to be clear at this time. Now, all of that being said, your reasons for being Catholic should not have exclusively be anchored into what Pope Francis or any one pope says. There's been 260 some odd popes. And beyond that, there's a church that goes way beyond just the papacy. So 
I understand your frustration. Believe me. Uh, I would just make sure that that is not... Uh, that's, when I've said there's a deal, the best reason you can have for not being Catholic in this day and age is like Pope Francis, President Biden, uh, Nancy Pelosi. I get it. Do your best to put them aside because you get a lot of nonsense, and that's sad. All right, uh, moving on. Brenda Guo says, uh, what's with the breastfeeding and natural childbirth articles on your Facebook feed from The Blaze? It doesn't sound like topics you would no normally post. There are a couple questions like this. So I have two Facebook feeds, one that I control that predates my um, uh, arrangement and uh, our partnership with The Blaze. Uh, that's the one that uh, I mentioned, Steve Dace. There's another Steve Dace show one that the Blaze exclusively controls. And frankly, guys, I don't, I barely got time to look at the one I control most days. I was made aware of this yesterday when Aaron, when you pinged me about it, but most days you could tell me that they've got live photos of an alien landing on that Facebook page. I'd be like, okay, because I just don't have time to check it. So I have absolutely no, my guess is that's just a company aggregator and we wrote columns about it and we promote our stuff internally and that's what people wrote about. All right, moving on. Susan Edgerton says, can the Mountain West be saved? I'm a Wyoming Cowboys fan and feel like we're being picked off one by one by the buzzards known as the Pac-12. I feel like this question is a trap. I feel like Todd is going full David Muir right now, and I'm, I'm unsure of how to answer. Like, is it okay to answer this question or am I walking right into a rant, which I would then deservedly be a target for because I answered it and entertained it? Or is the proper answer, I don't have time for an opinion on that right now. I just, but then am I rude to my audience? Because I did say, ask me anything. And you guys asked me this, you know, so am I, am I playing for an audience of one? I just, I'm trying to avoid the wrath of Todd Erzin or am I? playing for the actual audience here? Whew. That's a tough question. Um, it's a sticky wicket, Steve. It is. It is. <laughs> um, let me do this. No, the Mountain West cannot be saved, but we don't have time to even entertain it, but I'm very sorry that they're doing this to your league, even though I don't have time to be concerned. All right, next up, we go to Brad Moonstruck Loveless, who says, is there a difference between guilt and shame? Oh, boy, I wish we had more time for this question, because the answer is yes. Yes. And I, I know what we mean on the right when we th say things like the we, 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 you know, have a shameless culture. And that is a problem. But in, in, to put it as briefly as I can in the limited time I have, because we could do an entire Theology Thursday on this conversation. All right. But the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus picked up his cross and went to the cross, despising or scorning the shame. What does that mean? Well, that is a hearkening back to Genesis. The final verse of the Bible before Adam and Eve commit the first sin is they were naked in the garden. They had no shame. OK, so while it can be healthy for there to be a, a basis of shame in a society to say, there, those, those things are so shameful, I will not do them for fear of societal backlash, okay? And, and, and healthy societies will have those things to an extent. But as Christians, we need to understand that ultimately the point of the gospel is to remove, this, the, the, to remove that shame. That people are not weighed down by the shame of the sins that they committed, that they are forgiven for, but now have a, have life and life abundantly. Not in the Joe Osteen way of six washboard abs and 57 offerings, but the abundant life of being free now from their sin, free now to fulfill the purpose that God originally intended for them and created for them, free now to have the, the relationship with their creator they were always meant before eternity passed to have, before we sinned. And then free to experience that now for all of eternity. First, for every, however many days you have left in this, in this flesh outfit here in this fallen world. And then for all of eternity, spiritually and or with a, you know, uh, with, a new, uh, with a new body on a new heaven and a new earth in the age to come. 
That's what life and life abundantly means. So there is a difference between Christianity and moralism. And there's got to be, a, and there's a tight balance to strike there because a Christian society will have moral standards that then are, are helpfully aided and enforced by a fear of, of doing things that the society says are shameless for me to, to do. But we also can't carry it so far, however, that moralism replaces Christianity. What's the balance there? I don't know. Great men of God, way smarter than me, have argued and debated this point for 2,000 years. I just know, I don't know how to win that argument. I just know that it is an argument that we do need to have. And it needs to always be had. And now we're out of time. A great question. Those are really good questions. So appreciate each and every one of them. Appreciate each and every one of you. We're going to give you more if you're a subscriber with today's overtime in a moment. For the rest of you, we will see you tomorrow. Until then, Romans 8, 28. 